Well, as the head of the um, Christian Lobby for Israel, CPAC, in Washington, D.C., I see this as being perhaps the worst time that I can remember for an Israel-U.S. confrontation at the government level. Of course, Israel and America are great friends, and the, and the people of each country are very close to each other. But it looks like a collision course between the Netanyahu government, which is likely going to fight very strongly not to make concessions of land for peace when the whole land for peace equation for more than 15 years clearly has not produced peace, but the contrary. And Israel is today, as is America, faced with a terrorist threat and particularly a threat to its existence from the Iranian development of nuclear weapons and the clear threats from Iran to eliminate Israel and the Jewish people, genocidal threats, which we have documented. So, and, and Iran is using Syria, Hezbollah uh, up in the north, Hezbollah, Hamas in Gaza, and even elements of the uh, PLO or Fatah in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, to confront Israel and bedevil Israel on a day-to-day -day basis. Excellent, excellent question, excellent question. Now, I can tell you from the Pew Research poll on American opinions and the in impact of uh, beliefs on policy that some 42% of Americans, so that would be something over 145 million Americans, believe that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And a full third of Americans, so more than 100 million people, let's say, believe that this very Israel in the Middle East, between Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt, let us say, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, that this very Israel is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy from the old prophets of the Tanakh, or Jewish scriptures, which the Christians call the Old Testament, that this is, in fact, the literal fulfillment of those Bible prophecies. And so this is a, a great force and potentially a great political force to constrain any US, in, U.S. administration from pressuring Israel to uh, give away chunks of the uh, Judea, Samaria, biblical heartland, particularly uh, Jerusalem, in which uh, most of the city would be given away under the, the Saudi or Arab plan. Uh, and as the Israel gave away Gaza, and it yielded Hamastan to them, uh, Hamas run Gaza, and Israel really cannot abide that. And uh, in addition to the uh, biblical perspective or the heartfelt perspective of, of the ordinary American citizens, Christians, Jews, and others, there is the national security impact for America. And what I would do if President Barack Obama were standing right here was, would be to implore him not to go down the road of his predecessors, neither President Clinton nor President Bush. And let me explain a bit what I mean by that. President Clinton was so intent by every report I've read to get Yasser Arafat to yes on a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinian Authority that uh, President Clinton neglected to sign off on the operations orders that were ready to go to send uh, military and covert operations against Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban in Afghanistan and beyond. And so we might say with some, uh, some certainty that if he had done so, we might have avoided the tragedy of 9-11. And then President Clinton came in, and he was not going to press the, the Israel-Palestinian-Arab uh, peace process. He was going to sort of let it happen. But within a year, he began to uh, get involved and to press what became the two-state vision and the roadmap. And what happened when he, in his last year, uh, authorized uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to press at Annapolis for a one-year deadline to get to yes between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, this meant 
I believe that his time and attention and focus was taken off of the real threat in Iran. So he said that he would not abide Iran developing nuclear weapons. And yet, six months ago, there were reliable reports of what now has transpired uh, this very month that the reports are that Iran is close to enough enriched nuclear material, at least for a few warheads. And this combines with Iran's capability to place a satellite in space with uh, sophisticated missile systems. Now, 50 years ago, when that happened, when the Russians were able to place a satellite into space, this was the telltale sign to every responsible uh, military or security person that they could also uh, drop a warhead any place on Earth. Maybe not with complete precision, but with pretty good precision. So Iran is very close today not only to being able to uh, hit all of Israel with their missiles, but also um, able to hit Europe and very soon, if not now, able to hit America with a warhead. So really, this is what I believe our Defense Department, State Department, and White House should be focusing upon, the threat from Iran, as well as the continuing threat from, let's say, the Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, nexus uh, with Al-Qaeda and Taliban still strong, and uh, the need to um, wrap up well the, you know, the Iraqi uh, war. I've often looked at uh, Captain Ord Wingate as a model. He went to Israel in the late 30s and formed the special night squads of uh, British non-commissioned officers and Haganah Jewish fighters for uh, who would later be fighters for independence. And these special night squads uh, took on the Arab terrorists in the Galilee and prevented the attacks upon the, the uh, British pipeline from Baghdad to Haifa and also put an end to the attacks on the settlements and communities, kibbutzim, of the Galilee. And what Ord Wingate would often say, this Christian uh, uh, believer in the restoration of Israel, would say, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any nations or people, speaking from the Proverbs of the Tanakh, of the Jewish scriptures, or the Christians would say the Old Testament. So he came up in a Plymouth Brethren background, and our Christian uh, background is a little bit different, but still the Bible is the Bible and it's true. So I bring it home to America, that with all our knowledge of the Bible and how we have been so imbued with biblical knowledge and truth from the inception of our nation, there's a special responsibility on America to be righteous and in its policies, including its foreign policies, and I believe that this includes uh, blessing and favoring Israel, and at the very least, being fair to Israel and treating her in accordance with international law and in accordance um, with her great achievements in the Middle East. Well, often I'm asked, uh, what should Christians do? Because regularly we say, oh, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But I believe that there is a uh, proactive element in which Christians must really do something for Israel and the Jewish people. Because the scripture says, faith without good works, in other words, faith without like corresponding actions to demonstrate our faith is dead or, or fruitless or pointless. So when um, the scripture in Isaiah says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, well, what kind of comfort uh, does it speak of? Well, the kind of comfort that people need, that we really are with Israel and the Jewish people in a crisis or in the pinch. And so I've, we've all seen Schindler's List and we've seen now the new movie uh, Defiance. And in each case, we see that it's incumbent upon uh, Christians and others to help the Jewish people. And for example, when the scripture says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Well, this is often, shall we say, taken as a uh, superficial, well, we're going to say a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. But what that really means in Hebrew, and it was confirmed to me recently by the grandson of, uh, of uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda, by the same name, that the Hebrew really means diligently pursue and follow after the wholeness of completeness and well-being of Jerusalem, then shall you do well and
prosper and succeed. So that's really quite different. In other words, there's a proactive element there to ensure that Israel remains, you know, complete and whole and prosperous and really uh, Jewish. And uh, it's quite clear. As a matter of fact, I had it on good authority from um, Prime Minister, uh, Ar before he was Prime Minister, Arik Sharon and his uh, key uh, advisor, that when they met with Pope John Paul, he said, in effect, Jerusalem is holy to three religions, but it's only home to one people. And when I later said, said that in the presence of the papal nuncio uh, to, in Jerusalem, in effect, Vatic the Vatican ambassador to Israel, he said, well, that isn't exactly what he said, but it was even stronger than that. And he, uh, I don't recall the exact wording, but he, he, in effect, confirmed that it was even stronger than that. So somehow, in their heart of hearts, good Christian leaders of good faith know that there's a special bond between the Jews and Jerusalem and the land of Israel that is quite different from the bond of any other persons, be they Christian, Muslim, or otherwise. So I think that all, Jeru all Israelis are and should be resolute that Jerusalem will not be divided and Jerusalem will remain under Jewish custodianship. And as I saw when I was an environmental advisor there, sat on the Jerusalem District Planning and Building Commission, Israel has done a magnificent job, well recognized in the world, and they have, they have created a, a, a night and day situation after they uh, came into uh, possession again of all Jerusalem in 1967. It has been magnificent what Israel has done, and no need to dwell upon uh, the shabby state that Jerusalem was in, disease and wreckage and debris and lack of human services, lack of basic health before Israel got there, but it's a fact, yes, under Jordanian control. And so Israel, among other things, even if you didn't have the biblical basis that we have, Israel should be recognized for its achievement in really making Jerusalem, as the scripture says, a praise among the nations. Well, the Catholic Church, of which I was a member for the first uh, 30 some years of my life, uh, 34, 35 years of my life before I became, a, shall we say, a born again, spirit filled Christian. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church has room for everything. And there is a certain strain of thought or thread of thought in the Catholic Church which would like to see an internationalized city, sort of like what the UN resolution provided for in 1947. But I think. Uh, cooler heads understand diplomatically, politically, and otherwise that this is not going to happen. And I think if someone has an honest heart and a knowledge of history, if they've read even something quite popular and well-written like O Jerusalem by LaPierre and Collins, they'll see that the Jewish people cried out to everyone, including the Catholic Church and various prominent cardinals, uh, including American cardinals, to say, where are you? Why don't you come to our relief and aid and succor when the British-led Arab Legion of Jordan was shelling Jerusalem mercilessly with heavy artillery during the siege, and, and no one came to Israel's relief. So they said, you wanted this to be an international city. Where are the protectors of Jerusalem? And nobody came to our shame, America the Vatican and the world. So I think that all, Jeru all Israelis are and should be resolute that Jerusalem will not be divided and Jerusalem will remain under Jewish custodianship. And as I saw when I was an environmental advisor there, sat on the Jerusalem District Planning and Building Commission, Israel has done a magnificent job, well recognized in the world, and they have, they have created a, a, a night and day situation after they uh, came into uh, possession again of all Jerusalem in 1967. It has been magnificent what Israel has done and no need to dwell upon uh, the shabby state that Jerusalem was in, disease and wreckage and debris and lack of human services, lack of basic health before Israel got there. But it's a fact, yes, under Jordanian control. And so Israel, among other things, even if you didn't have the biblical basis that we have, Israel should be recognized for its achievement in really making Jerusalem, as the scripture says, a praise among the nations. Generally, there, there is a strain of Christianity which might be called replacement theology, in which uh, the church is thought to have replaced Israel 
for example, in what the prophets foretold would happen with respect to Israel. Some Christians might read that and say, this really refers today to the church, but I believe this is a uh, complete misreading of the scriptures and it leads you to very you know, strange and illogical conclusions. I'm not a theologian, but I'm a lawyer and a good uh, reader and analyst, I believe. And so I think it's very clear for any student of the Bible, particularly you know, the Christian Bible with the Tanakh or, or Old Testament and the New Testament to clearly discern what promises and provisions relate to Israel, what promises and provisions relate to the nations of the world, and which promises and provisions relate to the church. And we should keep those dis distinct. And so I'm very much of the majority opinion that uh, the promises that were made to Israel are, as Paul says in the book of Romans in the New Testament, particularly Romans 11:29, that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And he's speaking specifically of his Jewish people and the great promises and the great uh, gifts that have been given to them by God, including the inheritances and, you know, the land, the, the faith, the culture, and the religion. So uh, Paul is not, he says, has, has God abandoned the Jews? God forbid. And then he goes on to say that these gifts were irrevocable. So that's what I rest upon, this and parallel scriptures, which indicate that the promises of God are good. And as a matter of fact, they are a bellwether if we can't, if the Jews could not believe that the gifts in perpetuity really meant in perpetuity, how can we believe that what God says to us is really true?